Okay, so what I'm showing you here is the first stage that we worked on where we blocked in the painting. We started out with the earth tones and now we're mixing some color. And I'm going to put on a wash. This is a wash, a glaze wash that I'm putting down. And the glaze is basically like a thin coat of paint where I thin the paint down to almost like a watery substance. And I can put a tint. So often when you're painting, if the colors aren't correct, the colors, if you don't like the colors the way they are when it dries, you can literally put on another tint or a wash, glaze coat, which can change the color. So I noticed that there was some reflective color on the bananas. to the um, other side where the bananas are. So here I'm just kind of carefully uh, reworking the, uh, the shape in the foreground. The foreground, that's a, that's a uh, tomato, the large red shape. And then in the, behind that is a apple. So that's why the, uh, the foreground shape is uh, fuller and rounder and has a different appearance a different shape than a than you would have with a with an apple so I'm just going to continue to render this area here with the reds and the values and what I like to do is, is to uh, start with the the darker, put the darks down first and then bring the lighter colors on top and people often say they have a hard time trying to blend so in the initial in the initial rough-in stage we put down some darker tones and sometimes I put the tones down darker than they need to be then I'll paint over them lighten them a little bit and then that way it gives you an ease it makes it easier for you when you're trying to to blend something, if you blend the the lighter values over the the darker values, so I might do start with the darker values and then work the uh, the mid tones, and then from the mid tones work to the the lighter values, and then finally the last step would be to work the the highlights. So here I'm just working a con cross contour on the on the apple form. Just to bring that so when I'm painting with the brush strokes I'm trying to paint so that I could sculpturally move my work my marks along the shape of the apple so I'm just grabbing a little bit of that blue and it's just took a touch of that blue and I brought it into the red just to cool it down so here I'm just there's a tone in here, just a light tone in there. It's just kind of like light, like light paint. So you can, as you can see, what I was saying, I started out with the work into the lighter colors now. If this was watercolor, it would be in reverse. I'd start with the light colors and then work to the darks because it's acrylics or even oil paint you can lay in the darks and then work the lights on top always remind always remember that any color you put down first is going to have impact on the color that you put down on top and you can always make changes and you can make corrections as you move in, along with your painting The other thing, if you want to blend something, you can always, as you're working, um, paint and I use the rag just to blot up areas too. So everything is not done with the brush. Sometimes you just be painting and blotting and pulling stuff out. So I'm using the brush that I'm using is, is the round. So I'm kind of like going back into this thing, kind of redrawing, re 
redefining the the drawing. You notice that the detail stuff I didn't put in until like right now, going in and starting to work some of those edges. Working the watermelon around the sides of the watermelon. Now the green, it's really like a blue green. It's not like a full like on the color wheel. If it was on the color wheel it would be towards the blue side. So it keeps it cool in the dark, so I could bring that around into the dark area. But when you look at it, it appears to be green, but it's more of a blue green in that area. And our colors, one thing we remember that colors always look different in relationship to other colors. And if it doesn't if you don't get that right away, don't worry about it. Just lay them down. You can always put color down and you can always paint on top. Notice I'm working the watermelon. I don't even have the rind in the watermelon yet. You know, so I'll go back in and define the edges of the watermelon. And then later on go back in and put in the the watermelon rind. I, I didn't have any reference, but what I do know is that I'm working with the pink and the watermelon, I'm working with two sides and they have planes so like so in order to show the plane I use the light and value you'll see me do that a little bit later so here I'm just drawing the the watermelon the outside of the watermelon it kind of has a nice texture you know all that kind of lends itself in, into the painting so one of the thoughts that we talked about last week was that I brought in the watermelon they're just using a full watermelon I broke, sliced it so that I could you bring in more red. Yeah, you know, just threw in some seeds. So now I'm going to be painting the watermelon rind. And as I'm painting the watermelon rind, which, which the thing that's really helpful is that the red, that pink that was underneath isn't. It was good that I had that under there because I don't have to worry about trying to paint like I'm filling in the area I'm actually just kind of like laying the watermelon rind down and the green that I'm using on this side is like more or less like a cool green and then later on the top I'm going to introduce more of a warmer green just to kind of like help it to look like it's on this on a different plane once we're getting to show some shape now, just by working those edges. Paint these edges here. Kind of work that right around. I'm using the brush that I'm using is the uh, the filbert. So most of the work that I'm you the brushes that I'm using to paint mainly are the filberts and the flats. You can do it with a, with the rounds too, but for what I was doing. Sometimes you may see something advance a little bit because I painted a little before I decided to go back in. So here I wanted to bring in some light. So I bring in more blue, green there. And as I'm working, because this acrylic paint and it dries relatively fast, I'm not using any water or anything. And when I want to thin it down, I had a little bit of the uh, varnish, acrylic varnish there along the side. What that does is seals the paint so that the paint doesn't lift up when you're trying to paint. Sometimes when you paint, the paint may lift. To help avoid that, you can uh, use some of the acrylic varnish. Actually, I could have sealed the whole painting with acrylic varnish. 
just to keep things from lifting up. And sometimes that happens as you're painting. And working that edge a little bit more. When I realized that as I was painting the uh, the rind, that those the edges on the rind wouldn't be so perfect. So later on, I'll go back in and we'll warm up the green. So I still had the green there, so I just grabbed a little bit of the yellow just to warm it up and search around a little bit until I got the color back used the way I want them. See, like as we move along a little bit more, we're using very little paint. You really don't use that much paint. You think you need a lot of paint, but it's not, not a whole lot of paint to make this painting. I'm still using the same old plate right here. Well, I had my that dark in there, and now I want to just put in some of the the outside of the watermelon just to show a little bit of the, the texture and sometimes it's not always this uh, physical texture that, but sometimes just like some pattern maybe we should say pattern more or less the pattern on the watermelon so one of the things that was discovered we're doing still lives is that they can take on a life of their own um, depending on the type of still life what you paint what you decide to paint some of the um, subject matter could have a more of a cultural significance depending on the items that you choose so uh, you can see I have the stereotypical watermelon. Um, I could have painted um, paint a plate of some food, you know, some collard greens and and some sweet potatoes and things like that. And you would say, "Oh, okay, I know he. I know he must be an African American. You know, he's got those." Uh, you know, depending on the plate or what I put into the painting, could say a lot about what's there in front of you. The food that I, the food choices that I use, or the food choices that I decide to paint, can speak. So I went back into it and I thought about the, the watermelon. Also, like a lot of times, the watermelon has like. A little texture, even in the you know, the, the uh, pinkish part, and then also there's like that heart of the watermelon. So I go back in and put a little bit of heat around the inner section. So one of the things you'll find as you paint that there's like all these little discoveries and things that you'll think about as you're painting. Um, that maybe you weren't even thinking about them before. You just wanted to go and just paint it. Hurry up, paint it. But when you paint it, it's almost like um, doing research. You say, "Oh, you say, oh yeah, God, some of this, some of the things that I've missed, I need to go back in and, and put them in." So, so I sort of like worked in the in that area just to kind of bring that out a little bit. So as you work, don't be so quick. Take your time, and actually, the best thing you could do is to, like paint for a while, leave it. Now you're seeing me right now. You're seeing it in the video form, but I did leave, come back, start to videotape again. But as you're watching it, it looks like I'm just like I just stayed here and just continue to work on it. But I stepped away because there decisions that were made after I stepped away from it. So it's good like the, you have your little your setup, your painting setup, and then 
move away from your painting for a bit, a bit and then come back to it. Well, I think like this might have been a, a session here. And I'll uh, give you a, a little bit of an idea. Because you come back and say, oh yeah, I missed that. So on right here, you'll, see, you'll notice a little, probably a jump right there, right there. I had stepped away from the painting for a bit. And then I realized that even on, this, on the uh, seeds, it's not just like one flat color, it would be like a little brown, maybe a little highlight, a little dab. And it doesn't have to be super detailed, just a little bit of light detail on the seeds. And then in some areas we can see where the seeds, I just kind of like wipe the paint right over the seeds so that they can, they look like they're a little bit further back. Into the watermelon, a little deeper into the watermelon. The best thing you can always do is like if you're working. If you had the subject matter in front of you, you can really study it. And in fact, I, one of the things I like to do is like if I have the object in front of me, I can handle it. You know, I can actually put it in my hand and handle it and get a better feel for the subject matter that I'm working on. So that helps. But here I went in and put in a little bit more color into the center. And we were looking at last week this mixing a nice uh, like a purple, a, on more on the blue side, because purples can go from the red side or to the blue side. So you can notice over the top of the watermelon, it's like more towards the red side, and on the right side, it was more towards the blue side. So I'm trying to mix a purple that's more towards the, the blue side. And I need to mix enough paint, and think about it, I'm trying to mix enough paint so that I don't have to stop and mix paint again so I'm just yeah so I kind of found what I want a little bit I think I need to add a little more yeah there we go so I'm just laying this in with the palette knife a little and then I'll go back and I'll use the brush some too the unfortunate thing is that you're not able to see what this looks like surface wise but the way you paint you know, if you lay it down with a palette knife, you get like a smooth surface, uh, like a smooth sculptural surface. And if you lay it with a brush, you get like that brush surface. And also, when I'm laying in with the brush, I'm not going to hold the brush, always holding the brush straight up and down. I hold it on its side so it kind of like lays it down like I'm buttering it, buttering the, the um, the paint onto the surface and it also gives you a little bit more control when you're laying the paint down so if you haven't tried working with the palette knife try it you know going back to the brush try using your brush in different ways so I'm using the filbert again so I'm turning it on the edge which gives me a line and then when I turn it on the side whoops, like that so it's kind of like I'm just kind of like buttering it now it looks like I'm just filling in but I'm actually re sketch, redrawing by using the negative space around the banana and around the so I think about the space and you probably notice that I'm working around the painting, I'm not just working on one area of the painting. I work the background, go into work the objects in the painting. And you keep your mind thinking about the painting as a whole. So you don't want to just work on just one area. Now there are artists that do like work from the top and work down. But when they do do that, 
they usually put a sheet of paper over it so that they can see still see the painting as a whole as they're working working down the painting but I, I need to do this so that I can have my color relationships work for me and believe it or not if that had been a white background this lavender color would look entirely different but because I had that earth toned down first and now I'm laying in that lavender color it gives it more of an earthy look to it and it kind of helps to hold the painting together as I work the, the painting so some areas of the paint is going down thinner than others so, so it makes the wall look more realistic it doesn't look so flat because I have some areas that have a little bit more and they show, we call it little nuances of paint. And here I'm just kind of like moving. Sometimes they move the paint uh, brush slow and sometimes you move it fast. So here I'm moving the paint brush a little bit faster. The ideal position of the painting would be to have it up on an easel. So because I'm working for you, I have my camera overhead. I'm working on a flat surface, but normally I would, if I had my choice, I'd work on the on the easel. So now, with that lavender color, bringing that lavender color around the side of the watermelon, it brings out the green of the watermelon a little bit better. You know, when it was without that green, without the lavender color next to it, it didn't cause it to pop out. And you remember that that lavender color actually is more of a complement to the bananas. It's more of a complement to the to the apple on the left side and even the rind. So it kind of helps to bring out those colors. So when you, even when you're thinking about a, a still life, you can arrange things so that the colors work for you. You know, think about it when you're laying it out. And I, I have, I'm not saying I have any kind of magic to this because I, I have, I struggle with it. But I was trying to, you know, trying to figure out how I want to lay things out. That's where those thumbnail sketches come in handy. Because I, I made several of these. Some up, some looking at it close. Some looking, some of these uh, in, in different angles. So before deciding on this particular angle of view, and then even when you as you're working, you can still make changes. Now the shadows, you know, I put the shadows in. I was, See, I just laid some color right over the shadow. That was kind of cool. Give me a chance to really see that. But I laid color paint over the shadows. So now the shadows are don't just look like they're just standing on top of the page. They appear to be more on, in the surface a little bit more. They make them a little bit more realistic. So now I'll paint around the, the shadows. And I'll bring the shadows out. So I always like to paint the shadows a little bit more. Even if they're dark, I paint them a little bit thinner. So now I'm painting the negative space around the shadows to bring the shadows out a little bit more. And uh, around the, what I want to do is like, the closer the shadow is to the object, it's darker, but as it moves away from the object, it's a little bit lighter. So here I'm just kind of like redefining it around the edge of the shadow, and I can, I'm just going to use the same color. But like when I want it a little bit lighter, I'll just put more paint down. When I want it darker, I'll put a little bit thinner paint down. So that's it. that process is what we call a dry brush. So it's kind of like laying that paint down, almost like a 
scumming along the surface. Now, one of the other things you can do with this, and I didn't do it, but like what I was saying, like I'm redefining the edge here on that side. In the rough stage, you didn't see these objects as being so de um, defined, but as we start to lay in the paint around them, we can kind of like bring them out more. This helps to bring them out. So some of these color traces that we use, in this case, I was trying to figure out the ground. I had no real decision, but I saw that it kind of worked already. So I just worked the paint that same color, but just added more paint. Now I could shift the whole thing when it dries by putting a glaze over it. You know, I could, I could get a, like a wash of green or a wash of blue or whatever. Just cleaning up that edge. The top the brush. I use the top of the brush to, to make that edge. Now I'm laying the brush, painting, painting with the brush more on its side when I was moving down. And I have enough paint to do this whole foreground. Lay the paint down. You just always want to think about your know, like your brush strokes, like the pad, your, your like I'm painting these on a kind of like on a diagonal, it's going down on the surface. Working this surface. Just bring, like working my paintbrush around, I look around, searching. I try to, you know, I'm do, defining the shadow by working the paint around the shadow. Work this area here. Now, I mean, this was an earth tone underneath. And one of our paintings that we're going to be doing will be basically done with earth tones. But here was an earth tone underneath. I could have had like color, a lot of different colors underneath and then work the paint on top. And it would give me a different effect. When you see me kind of like stop for a minute, I'm thinking. Usually, you know, when you think fast, I was going to speed this up and do it in fast time, but. You, you can learn more this way by seeing it this way than just putting on a show. Here we're just redefining the shadows. Look around the edges. I found that I need to go back and work in that tomato. You know, right now it's, it doesn't have any mid-tones or highlights or anything in it. So I'm going to go back in there and kind of bring that out a little bit. in a mid value and I look around to see other areas of the of that same object that may need that same tone bringing some of the reflective light down the bottom and it helps to make it look more full give it more of a fuller form by bringing in the sculpting that form 
the bottom. Bringing some of that mid to mid value now, I'm going to go in and do a little bit more of the highlight. And what's interesting, you know, we see the highlight, it's like, boom, it's like too high. It looks really bright. But now when I bring in it, another tone of the highlight, lighter than that, all of a sudden, you're going to notice that it doesn't look as bright as it did before once I bring in a little bit lighter tone on top. I'm just going to, here, just by to drop that in there. And then I'm going a little bit lighter again. So now the other t value looks a lot lighter, a lot darker than that value. And it doesn't stand out as much. So I just put the two catch lights on it, on the uh, tomato. You can do the same thing if you were doing an eye, you know, if you're doing an eye, the eyeball. You know, it would have this kind of same shape, just the colors would be different. And that's kind of like what makes them look like, oh wow, it looks like the eyes follow me. You know, I'm just going around looking for areas that need to be defined, re reworked. outer edge that's been bugging me. Yeah, so fix that right there. And work that edge. a little blue to it to kind of help gray it down a little bit and to darken it. Working that edge. Just kind of darken that edge a little bit. And also try to retain the, the reflective light at the same time. And the paint that I'm using here is not really, it was kind of no, no medium in it at all. It's really um, paint that has, so here is the paint. I'm going to use this um, acrylic varnish. This is a satin finish. And I have like an uh, inexpensive brush that I picked up from Home Depot. And I'm just basically, literally just low, laying it down, just pouring it down. Eventually, I probably would have put like two coats of varnish on it. Just what it does, the nice thing that it does is it kind of makes the painting look like it did when, um, when you were painting when it was wet. So it gives it a nice look to the painting, a nice finished look to your painting. Because you'll probably notice in your painting, you may have some areas that are flat, and then you'll have some areas that are shiny. That's not you, it's the paint. So to even it out, I'll go back into it with some varnish, color varnish.
the tape on, only on the black, on the canvas pad. Just so that the, uh, it presents it nicely. If you're working on canvas, you can just paint to the edge of the canvas. Or you can even paint around the edges of the canvas if you don't want to frame it. 